Um, our theme today is the mystic power of prayer, a theme taken from Sir John's book, and the spiritual law, which is a direct quote, there is a mystic power in prayer, and it works. Um, this is a, a wonderfully uh, cogent way of expressing one of the, the perhaps the deepest truth of the spiritual life, uh, that, that prayer works, but not only that prayer, that prayer works is one of the great mysteries, actually, but what prayer signifies, what it symbolizes about the nature of life is something I'll try to come back to before this, uh, our time in this video is over. over excuse me. Um, but the, the fundamental question arises, uh, one question that arises is, what is, why do we pray? What is the origin of prayer? Uh, and, uh, and why is prayer so pervasive? It's clear that prayer and its variations, contemplation, meditation, um, is, a, is a virtually universal phenomenon, a virtually universal human phenomenon. Really before uh, the rise of kind of anti-prayer and unpraying uh, societies in the 20th century, mostly associated with uh, uh, totalitarian communist uh, societies, uh, most of which have disappeared, a few do remain. Uh, except for such societies before the 20th century, it was probably virtually impossible to find a society which was explicitly anti-prayer. Not that everybody in a society prayed and not that people stopped praying in these societies as well. Prayer is built in, it seems, into human life. And um, of course, some people will respond to that, and certainly an atheist, a materialist, an agnostic may say, I don't pray, and I'm not here to suggest that people should pray or they need to pray or they need to meditate. Um, but I do think that it's a deeply rooted uh, reflex within us, um, and even, uh, even if you are a stalwart foe of the very idea of prayer, because prayer, after all, does signify something about the nature of life that is not ultimately compatible with a strictly materialistic view of life. Even if you're, even if the most stalwart foe or opponent of prayer, the gesture sometimes is still there. It hasn't been completely rooted out. Good example is if, is if, uh, and hopefully this isn't an experience anybody has anytime soon. You find yourself in the waiting room of an emergency room. And the, the door opens and out comes the doctor and within you find yourself saying, please. The question is, to whom is the please directed? And, and you could say, well, there's no one to whom it's directed. It's just a reflex. Exactly. Why is it so deeply rooted? Who are we saying please to? What would we be saying please to? What, what, ir, what, how irrational that would be to expect that a kind of a hope could change reality, unless it's not irrational. And that, of course, is a clue uh, that prayer provides us to the, f to the fact that maybe reality is fundamentally spiritual at its core. Or another example would be if you're on a, on a plane that suddenly starts shaking violently and you think, oh, please, oh, oh no, please, let it just, let it go nice and smoothly to the airport. So that's a prayer gesture, whether it has any ultimate significance or not, that's a separate question. But it's a reflex that many of us have. Um, so the question then, um, a deeper question is, what does this gesture, this reflex symbolize? Um, we, there's a, a literature on prayer. There's a, a fine book that surveys the, the history of prayer and its, its significance from many perspectives. The book uh, called Prayer by, uh, by uh, Carol and Philip Zaleski. Uh, I've used that in my courses. Um, if we were to look at prayer simply symbolically, without looking at the anthropology or, uh, of prayer, um, we would see that symbolically prayer does seem to suggest that we human beings do feel ourselves in a, as finite entities in a condition of dependency. Now, we know that we are dependent uh, beings. I mean, after all, I, I'm dependent upon the city functioning and that there's no snowfall and that there's somebody making lunch and that someone's running the camera and that the car works, all of that. 
I'm dependent upon my health in order to be able to present this. These are all, this, these contingent circumstances are also changeable, that it only takes the slightest change in one of those variables for this not to be able to occur. And so, of course, we're dependent. That's written into the nature of being uh, an entity upon this planet. And that makes us feel vulnerable, but it can also open us up to a sense of uh, dependence uh, upon a greater reality, a higher reality. And so what prayer then does seem to symbolize is it seems to symbolize on the one hand that we are not, as these physical forms, the ultimate masters of our existence, but it also then suggests to us that by turning in that gesture of prayer, we can reintegrate ourselves into the whole fabric of life. So prayer then becomes, sort of like the phases of the moon, uh, an item in a natural uh, revelation, a constant reminder to us, uh, a secret of life, that the way to find freedom from that from anxiety and fear is to reconnect ourselves through contemplative practice to the greater reality out of which we arise. Now, I'm not here to enforce that view upon anyone. I'm a religious studies professor. I can speak about religion uh, as I understand it uh, without insisting that it's true. Personally, I'm, I'm a religiously and spiritually sensitive human being. I'm a pluralist, uh, so, but I in no way think that prayer and spirituality is a definite fact that's been proven conclusively for everyone. We have freedom in these areas. But since ancient times, before ancient times, uh, and back in Neolithic times, and now even recently, some evidence shows that uh, um, even um, in, in the predecessors of Homo sapiens sapiens, Neanderthals, even they placed flowers in graves, placing flowers in a grave. What an extraordinary symbol. The use of red ochre, which is uh, iron, uh, uh, iron ore with clay, since ancient times, the use of red ochre has symbolized perhaps blood, uh, the blood of, of rebirth. Uh, it's symbolizing life. So the use of flowers and red ochre for 50, 60,000 years in grave and in, in burial sites and the use also in cave paintings indicates that since ancient times and before ancient times, human beings have been aware of a spiritual dimension to life. And prayer is one of those ways in which we actualize that spiritual dimension of life. Now, one of the main themes in this course is, uh, and in Sir John's work, uh, is to point out the, uh, the, the relationship uh, or the, ver the verification of religious ideas through scientific methods. And um, prayer, of course, uh, has been shown in many studies to be a positive factor in people's health. A recent uh, meta-study by a, a team of people headed up by Talita Simao uh, in a 2016 study, The Effect of Prayer on Patients' Health, a systematic literature review, shows that uh, um, prayer uh, in seven of the 12 studies that they surveyed reduces anxieties uh, in mothers whose children have cancer. It provides improved physical functioning for patients who believe in prayer. And the recommendation of this, of this team of, of, of researchers, researchers is that prayer is a non-pharmacological intervention and resource and should be included in the nursing holistic care aimed at patients' well-being. That's just one of many studies. Mindfulness is also a form of contemplative activity along with prayer. Mindfulness is the most, uh, most widely researched form of contemplative practice these days. Um, and proven health benefits of mindfulness include reductions in stress, reductions in emotional pain, reductions in depression, reduction in sleep disorders, a reduction in high blood pressure, that was the discovery of uh, Dr. Benson at Harvard Medical School in the 1970s, a reduction in addictions, and more recent studies have shown that uh, mindfulness can reduce mind wandering. And according to that study, a wandering mind is an unhappy mind, and I would say that a still mind, a concentrated mind, is a happy mind, a happy and effective mind. And and mindfulness and other contemplative practices have been shown to uh, improve mood, to improve immune function, to improve cognitive performance, and to actually have an effect upon heart rate variability. So this is really good overall for cardiac, for, for, for cardiac health. Um, and this is, these are extraordinary benefits of prayer or meditation or, or meditative practices. 
Um, so, and these are all very important practical outcomes of, of having a contemplative practice in one's life. Now, a pragmatic a, a, a perspective, uh, which seems to prevail these days more than formerly in the medical community, simply accepts these facts and doesn't resort to any kind of metaphysical or religious explanation of them. But I'm a philosopher. And I can't help but ask myself if the effectiveness of these, of these practices and their pervasiveness in human society does not actually suggest a metaphysical explanation that points us towards the idea that the universe is fundamentally a spiritual reality and that our material existence is just one finite aspect of what overall can be seen as a divine, uh, a divine realm uh, from which we all arise and to which we all return. So I would suggest then that prayer uh, is a way of, place, uh, of overcoming reductionistic tendencies to see our life as sim simply in terms of physics and chemistry.